Karen challenges us to take an honest look at where modern feminism has failed in its approach to men and men's issues, and where it may have become a force impeding gender equality as a whole. She will argue that in treating women like children and men with disdain, society becomes unable to confront complicated issues that require us all to work together. So please join me in welcoming Karen Strong. Okay. Can, can you all hear me? Yeah. Um, just uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for showing up. And, uh, you know, I, I just I want to start off uh, by saying I was thinking of wearing a red shirt tonight. And then I thought, if there are any little sort of red dots hovering around my torso, it'd be easier to spot against black. And, and uh, so uh, if any of you all at some point tonight happen to see one of those, I'm going to thank you in advance for yelling duck. Um, thank you, CAFE, for inviting me here and uh, for being really, really helpful, uh, you know, rearranging their day when I missed my flight uh, by exactly four minutes this morning. Um, thanks to Ryerson's uh, president for making the decision to have the university absorb the extra security costs required for this event. And of course, thank you all for coming here. Um, now, some of you might not be aware that in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be in New Hampshire taking part in a panel discussion uh, with a feminist Naomi Wolf. And the discussion topic will be, is feminism necessary? And I expect that the mere asking of that question is going to evoke more gasps of outrage and more animosity from the audience than a similar but slightly different question asked at a recent Monk debate, uh, actually a resolution. Be it resolved, men are obsolete. Um, you know, and if we're going to take a, a moment to examine the uh, the subjects of these two propositions, right? You know, one uh, is a group of people defined by an accident of birth, and the other is a, a political movement, a set of goals, and a way of thinking about the world. And even if we take a moment to examine the words necessary and the word obsolete, right? What did they tell us? Uh, not necessary tells us that something isn't intimately tied to our survival. Uh, you know, we would be talking about a really awesome movie that it wouldn't kill us to not see, but we'll still pay for it, and we'll still enjoy, and we still really want to see it. Uh, we'd be talking about jewelry or makeup or perfume or a vacation to the Bahamas or a million things people consider as having value, even though they're not necessary to your continued existence. Um, you know, and some things that are necessary are really unpleasant. And, uh, you know, things like occasionally vomiting is necessary for your continued survival, and nobody likes to do it. Uh, washing dishes, shoveling snow, paying your bills, working a job you don't like. All necessary, right? But you don't want to do them. In many cases, we begrudgingly do what is necessary so that we can, if we're lucky, indulge in what is not necessary. You know, we all need to eat but we don't need to pay a hundred bucks a plate for food prepared by a celebrity chef. So necessary imposes no judgment of worth or value or of good or bad. But then there's obsolete. What are the implications of that word? What types of things do we apply it to? Leaded gasoline, uh, VHS players, uh, eight track tape players, rotary dial phones, ice boxes. You know, things you throw in the trash when they're no longer useful to you. Because they take up space you'd rather fill with something else, something that gets it done better, right? It's an appraisal of value to a user and has definite connotations regarding good or bad. We have things like dumps, scrap yards, and recycling facilities in part because we need some place to leave things that are obsolete. We put the obsolete things that are no, no, no longer useful or no longer good enough for us right there and then we replace them with something better. What are the implications of that word when it's applied not to a tool or an appliance or a software program, not even to a set of ideas or a philosophy, but to a demographic of people, human beings designated solely by an accident of birth? What does it say about us as people that we're totally cool with that? Be it resolved, men are obsolete. You might as well say, men, justify your existence. 
you know, I'm not going to bore everyone here with the mind-boggling array of statistics that prove that men are not, in fact, obsolete. Anyone can go look at the Census Bureau's labor statistics and observe that it is almost entirely men who keep the lights on, the water running, and the planes from falling out of the sky. Our comfortable, mostly smoothly operating, safe, orderly existence is built and maintained almost entirely by men. Suffice to say that if all men walked off the proverbial job at work and at home for three days, we would be three years cleaning up the mess. It takes a particular brand of narcissism to be able to sit in a climate-controlled office building or stand on a stage in front of a national audience and declare that a class of people who comprise over 90% of the individuals who build and maintain the whole shebang are candidates for the scrapyard because they're no longer good enough for us. And if men are obsolete, all I can say is it's an engineered obsolescence, engineered by institutional social and legal policies that prioritize women's participation in school and at work, that prioritize their feelings and minimize any harm a woman might do, enabled by the very level of comfort, convenience, and safety provided mostly by men, which ensures most women will go through their entire lives never having to perform even once any of the types of tasks necessary to keep the food moving from farm to grocery store or even to see that work as it's happening. Most of us are so divorced psychologically from the absolutely necessary labor of mostly men that make our lives livable. It's like we believe that box of cereal appeared on the store shelf just by magic. Women are net consumers of the product, the product being our safe, comfortable, convenient, and plentiful society. Its manufacturers are nearly all men. Obsolete indeed. The Monk debate resolution was argued for and against by four women. Four feminist women, though I'm not sure Camille Paglia's self-applied label dovetails with her dissident views, and her opening statement contained none of the condescensions of Maureen Dowd's who likened men to an unnecessary but appreciated indulgence. I believe she compared them to ice cream. Polly's speech mirroring much of what I've said here should have sealed the debate for her side if anyone in the audience were capable of wrapping their heads around what life would be like without men. Instead, the women arguing in favor of the resolution managed to convince a lot of people in that audience who had disagreed with the resolution at the outset to change their minds by the end. Not long after, TV Ontario's Steve Pakin did an episode of The Agenda where he assembled a panel of all men, including U of T prof professor of psychology Jordan Peterson and CAFE's own Adam McPhee, as well as some pro-feminist men to discuss the implications of the debate and the position of men in society currently and moving into the future. A commenter on the YouTube upload of that episode criticized the host for not having a single woman on the panel. This is where you're at, gentlemen. It is somehow just fine for four women whose entire careers have been built on putting a focus on women's needs, lives, status, well-being, health, and experiences to debate the resolution that men are obsolete. It is apparently completely unacceptable that a bunch of men with differing perspectives assemble on a current events show to discuss that debate and the questions it raises regarding men's needs, lives, status, well-being, health, and experiences not having a woman on such a panel is somehow unfair. And the sad thing is, the commenter wasn't even a feminist. Indeed, she seemed quite opposed to feminism, but she still deemed it unfair and inappropriate to have an all-male panel talking about men's lives and experiences. You know, it's almost like people in general don't trust men to engage in a conversation about men with other men. They can talk about golf, or the traffic, or work, or the economy, just not about their lives as men. It's almost like people believe men have no right to an opinion about themselves. The, that men require the civilizing influence and constant monitoring of women in any such discussion so that they don't do or say anything bad or come to any inappropriate conclusions. And sometimes, as we see here at Ryerson, being a woman is not enough. You have to be the right kind of woman. Not long ago, at this university, those two women and one man applied to the Students' Union for official status, and in response, you all have heard what the Students' Union did. 
Their charter now implies that the very idea of men talking about their problems outside of the ideological framework of feminism is misogyny, and that any men's rights group doing so is automatically a hotbed of misogynistic thinking that promotes violence against women. Unpoliced thoughts and speech are dangerous things, don't you know? Especially if they're being thought or spoken by a man. Feminism is not just the privileged voice on this topic. It demands a monopoly on it. Other voices and opinions should be gagged or shouted down. Look at the objection to this event. I might be a woman, but I'm not a woman's woman. I'm not a feminist. And uh, therefore, any ideas I have about gender issues, whether they be about men and masculinity or women and femininity, are dangerous, misogynistic, and invalid. The fa very fact that I consider femin a feminism a flawed and invalid model of how the world works is so offensive, it requires that the world be protected from me. Despite an ethic of peaceful discourse and protest, People who advocate for men are subjected to violence and intimidation from people who object to the idea that men have a right to have a valid opinion of themselves, even if that opinion does not conform to feminist thought. The extra security provided commendably by the president and administration of this university was made necessary because of the history of violence of correct thinking people who protested talks given by incorrect thinkers like Warren Farrell, Janice Fiamengo, Paul Nathanson, and Catherine Young. At those events, protesters objecting to non-feminist discussions of issues like male suicide rates, porn addiction, and negative stereotypes of men were filmed breaking a number of laws. As defined by the provisions of Canada's criminal code, they broke the law by assaulting attendees and police, illegally pulled fire alarms, and, concealing, and concealed their faces. Yet not a single criminal charge against any one of them has ever been levied. Yet my ideas and the ideas of CAFE and others, other men's advocates that men have a right to have an opinion on gender issues, that men, even people, have a right to examine those issues in a non-feminist framework, that men and their allies and advocates have a right under Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms to speak their minds about issues that relate to men and women, and that they have a right to do so without being subject to retributive in intimidation and violence, just as feminists do and should, is somehow dangerous and violent misogyny, and therefore unacceptable. I find it ironic that feminists have used intimidation and violence to shout down a group of people who have a history of an ethic of peaceful advocacy. I also found it ironic when one of the comments on that Facebook post, uh, where the original poster instructed people to rip, rip all the posters down that were publicizing this event, uh, an event about the censorship of men's issues said, censorship of men's issues, lol, like that ever happens. <laughs> yeah, quite literally, in a post promoting censorship of a discussion of men's issues, he scoffed at the claim that men's issues awareness groups are subject to censorship. How very meta. Yesterday, I spoke, it's just like Inception. Uh, yesterday, I spoke with a conservative radio show host based out of Calgary. I disagreed with that guy on pretty much everything he thought about gendered issues. But the one place we did find common ground was in the concept of free speech and the free marketplace of ideas. He conveyed to me that his philosophy was that if someone's really crazy and really has dangerous thoughts, uh, you know, or an invalid idea, let him talk. In a truly free society where everyone is allowed to speak, the competition between ideas will determine which ideals, ideas prevail. And not to go all go Godwin on everybody, <clears throat> but it only took the support of 10% of the German population to keep the Nazis in power. Only 10% of Germans agreed with the Nazis, right? Oh, well, it, it also took the fact that the other 90% were forbidden from speaking their dissent. Feminism, too, has a long history of silencing uh, or opposing competing ideas, right? Think about the travails of Erin Pitsy, the woman who founded the first battered women's shelter in the world in 1971, and uh, who found, incidentally, that over 60% of the women in her shelter were at least as violent as the men that they were fleeing. In response to her stating this uncomfortable and inconvenient truth, 
Radical feminists picketed her everywhere she was invited to speak and bombarded her with death threats against her, her children, and even her grandchildren. At one point, the police ordered her to redirect all her mail to the bomb unit so she could check it before it was opened. Okay. She lived under police protection for years, and when her family dog was shot, she finally fled the UK to live in hiding in the US. You know, yet another irony. Feminists objected so strenuously to the idea that women can be violent that they responded with threats and acts of violence. <laughs> Don't say I'm violent or I'll kill you. <laughs> Even here in Toronto's criminal courts right now, this type of quagmire of hypocrisy is playing out. A man, Gregory Allen Elliott, is on trial for criminal harassment for criticizing feminists on Twitter. The story is a convoluted one, but boils down to this. Three feminist women, including Stephanie Guthrie, were actually conspiring to harass another man in real life because they disapproved of his perfectly legal, but in their opinion, un unsavory ideas and behavior. Gregory Allen Elliott tweeted his disapproval of their plans. The police found nothing even vaguely threatening in any of the tweets. All he did was criticize their actions and tactics as revenge rather than justice on Twitter and then stop speaking when they told him to. He's facing a six, possible six-month prison sentence because apparently vehemently and persistently disagreeing with a feminist leaves her in fear for her safety, which is the entire sole basis of that charge. It's quite the irony that when feminists are called out on their own harassment of another person, they accuse the person doing the calling out of harassment. Ironic that Ms. Guthrie then followed that incident up with a talk at TEDx neatly avoiding any discussion of Mr. Elliot or her own abuse of the criminal justice system to intimidate and harm him, while emphasizing the importance of speaking out about mean and harassing behavior, which one assumes is exactly what Mr. Elliot believed he was doing when he criticized Ms. Guthrie and her friends. Ironic that feminists like Ms. Guthrie constantly push the idea that the internet is an unsafe space for women and that women should not suffer from bullying for being, from being bullied for being outspoken when it's a man facing a prison sentence for having the temerity to speak his mind online. Ironic that she can talk about women's empowerment, women's equality, and women's fitness to lead in politics while simultaneously characterizing a difference of opinion between a man and a woman as a threat to the woman's life and safety and using this imagined threat as a justification for punishing people who say things she doesn't like. I am terrified of the prospect that someone like Ms. Guthrie, who is so very quick to abuse society's sexist and frankly Victorian belief that women require and deserve protection even from words that make them feel hurty inside, in order to bring criminal charges against someone expressing a different opinion will ever be elected into any position of political authority. It is one thing to abuse the power of a threat narrative to pressure a private corporation like Facebook to remove material that hurts your feelings. Quite another to have someone that eager to silence dissent holding the power of public office. As a purveyor of dangerous ideas, namely that feminism is not the only way or even an appropriate way to examine gender issues, that men suffer from a unique complex of problems and challenges, none of which are ultimately caused by the systemic hatred of women, that an ideologically, ideologically toxic body like the Canadian Federation of Students or the Ryerson Students Union is not the ultimate authority on whether misandry is a thing, I am terrified by the idea of anyone using violence, intimidation, or the power of state and legal institutions to silence people who express disagreement with any ideology. I absolutely defend feminists' right to yell at me, call me names, say mean things about me, as long as they're true, and engage in political protest against my opinions and words. I object to any form of ideological totalitarianism, and the suppression of speech is one of the first signs that that has a foothold. It is tota that totalitarianism that we have witnessed here in Toronto with the Ryerson Students Union's blocking of official status for any men's issues awareness society that does not employ a feminist model of gender, with Stephanie Guthrie and her abusive manipulation of society's prejudices to harass and intimidate people who disagree with her. Pretty sure nobody's going to openly disagree with her anytime soon. 
she kind of nipped that one in the bud for anybody who was thinking about it. Uh, you know, with protests against cafes, events that have turned ugly, violent, and criminal, but oddly enough, have resulted in not a single charge. It's really time for both men and women to stand up and speak out about men's issues and concerns, their rights, or in some cases, their lack of them. This is not something men can do alone. Because men have no acceptable, socially acceptable way to defend themselves in a conflict with a woman. Because any angry conflict between a man and a woman, the man is more likely to be cast as the aggressor. And that counts for feminism, which is women by proxy. Disagree with feminism and you're hurting women. When you're hurting women, someone does something about it. Men do need safe spaces on campus, and one of the very interesting things I have noticed in my travels is that when we talk about safe spaces, us, in this movement, we're not talking about the same thing that feminists want for women. You know, a place where nothing mean or offensive will ever be said to you. What men need is a place where they can speak freely and candidly about issues that affect them. Hopefully more Canadian campuses will come to understand that yes, men do have issues. Yes, they deserve a space to talk about them too. And no, men do not require the supervision and policing of feminists to do that. Safe spaces already exist for feminists online, places where commenting is heavily moderated, where no one is allowed to say anything bad about women or feminism or whatever else is their issue of the day. And if they even hint that they might say something bad, they get the boot. Those places are echo chambers, and that's something I would be horrified by if it became commonplace in our movement. Diversity of voices and ideas is a healthy thing. If an idea does not stand up to challenge or scrutiny, it's probably garbage. What is happening in these echo chambers is the ideas remain untested and unchallenged, and then the psychological investment in the worldview expressed there only increases. What is happening here in the rest of the world right now is a near constant attempted annexing of other spaces to turn them into those safe spaces where the rules of the echo, echo chamber apply. Feminists and others who promote the suppression of free speech should be told no. Ryerson's president took an excellent first step the other day in absorbing the costs for the extra security, but it's not enough. Men need a real space, and women need to help them build it. And it can't be a useful space within feminism, because feminism defines men as a privileged class and redefines every male hardship as a side effect of society's hatred for women, when it's just not the case at all. It's the nature of power that it seeks to preserve itself. This is not just a criticism I have of feminism. It's true no matter what political philosophy or ideology is dominant at the time. Currently, the dominant ideology on gender issues is feminism, and their identification and analysis of men's problems and concerns would be embar an embarrassment to anyone capable of critical thinking. And if some of them had their way, I would have been forbidden from ever saying that. That's, that's all I got written. I figured we might do a nice lengthy Q&A or 